Okay. Uh, the session is being recorded. Uh, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's uh, session on the uh, API Connect Micro Gateway Deep Dive. Um, we have several folks in the, from, the, uh, from the development team on uh, here today to be able to present and, and deep dive for us. Um, we'll, uh, this is a long session, so we'll try to logically uh, ar arrange uh, times and pauses where we can ask questions. Um, using the meeting chat is a good way to, uh, uh, you know, get those questions out there um, so folks can, uh, you know, answer them kind of in line. Um, but, you know, without further ado here, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Uh, so, uh, so Tim, um, thanks for, uh, for coming. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Tim Smith, and uh, I'm the overall lead of the Micro Gateway Development Team. Um, this presentation is uh, purely a chart deck uh, presentation. Um, uh, several members of the team, uh, in, in, uh, several members of the development team, uh, will be presenting uh, pieces that uh, they were the experts on uh, that did the development for. Um, so let me let me first off uh, just kind of walk through the agenda, and tell you a little bit uh, about it. Uh, I'll go through uh, at a high level and talk to uh, the micro gateway. Uh, the components, uh, a little bit of that. Um, and then uh, Libra Huang is going to take us through uh, the design of the flow engine and the, the micro gateway in general, um, all of the different middleware components uh, that comprise uh, of the micro gateway. Um, and then we're going to, to go into security for a bit. Uh, so Dan Bat, uh, Bot will take us through the uh, security overview. He'll also talk about uh, client ID and client secret uh, validation. Uh, then John Balesa is going to take us through a, a couple of sections uh, on security. One will be basic auth uh, and the other uh, will be cores. Uh, we did have a slot uh, for basic rate limiting and advanced rate limiting. Uh, that's not going to be in today's presentation. We'll uh, set that aside for a, a second session, if you will. Uh, then Ali Zhuang uh, uh, from our Taipei team uh, will present uh, the Invoke policy. Um, she'll also present uh, the sequential logic that you can use uh, within the micro gateway. Uh, in particular, the, the flow engine uh, allows you to uh, use logical conditional constructs uh, to um, determine uh, what path your flow will take, and Ali will take us through some of those. Uh, then Gary, too, uh, will take us through uh, the set variable policy. Yi Hong Wong uh, is going to talk a little bit about basic analytics, uh, what you get with the micro gateway. Um, he'll also uh, take us through a JavaScript policy. And then Thomas Burke uh, will take us through something like a more advanced uh, JavaScript policy called a user-defined policy. And Dan Bat Bot uh, will then again uh, uh, take us through uh, logging and what is available there. And last but not least, uh, I believe uh, John Palgon uh, will be presenting uh, uh, the data exchange between API management uh, and the micro gateway and the, the last session there uh, for uh, on-premise installation, uh, Jeremy Geddes uh, will not be presenting in this section. Uh, again, we'll hold that off uh, for a second session. Um, feel free to, to ask questions. Uh, you, you know, I think we'll pause at specific spots, but I, I'm certainly fine with uh, uh, answering questions as we go. Um, everybody is on mute. You'll have to hit star one uh, if you wish to come off of mute. Okay, so I, I just wanted to uh, make a couple of comments uh, on this chart. Uh, uh, this was one put together by the offering management team, uh, in particular, uh, Arif Siddiqui, um, uh, laid it out, and I just wanted to talk to a little bit about uh, the offerings and where the micro gateway fits in. So the, the Essentials uh, offering uh, is uh, freely downloadable. Um, it comprises or consists of uh, um, essentially the NPM API Connect installation, uh, which contains uh, the micro gateway. Um, but also uh, there is a, an APIM uh, component 
uh, which must be obtained uh, through the download site for Passport Advantage. Um, but with the essentials, uh, uh, we talk about uh, uh, down at the bottom, uh, kind of the secure. Um, these are the policies uh, that you get uh, with the micro gateway. Uh, so uh, there's obviously the proxying to a back-end uh, uh, API, if you will. Um, you're only allowed uh, one instance, um, uh, but there are a collection of built-in policies. These are a subset of the policies that you would get uh, with the data power appliance. So client ID and secret, uh, basic auth, basic rate limiting, uh, cores, uh, the invoke policy, set variable policy, and JavaScript invoke. Um, then moving over to the essentials, again, staying, uh, or moving over to the professional and staying within that uh, secure uh, row, um, it's basically the same level except that you're allowed uh, multiple instances of the micro gateway. Uh, there also is the ability to use a Liberty Collective uh, for deploying those instances. And also the uh, rate limiting uh, is more advanced in that uh, uh, it's shared between uh, those two instances. So that's, that's really uh, where uh, the micro gateway uh, fits in uh, within the offerings. So what is the micro gateway at a, at a very high level? It's a node-based uh, platform uh, consisting of a collection of middleware components. So, so we really took the strong loop uh, gateway uh, uh, infrastructure and basic design uh, and added uh, a considerable amount to it. Uh, we restructured it, uh, added the flow engine so that you would have this uh, architected processing uh, of an assembly section uh, of a Swagger document. Um, it does consist of uh, uh, several pieces of middleware uh, one of which is the flow engine, and Libra will take us through uh, some of the other uh, middleware components. Um, the micro gateway is really there uh, for enforcement um, uh, of the APIs. Um, it consumes uh, Swagger 2.0 API definitions. Uh, I guess there's a new version or a, a new name uh, for Swagger, and, and I'm not sure uh, of the name. I thought I had updated this chart, but. Um, I don't see it. Um, the assembly portion is an IBM extension, so it's, uh, it, it is uh, formally complies with the Swagger 2.0 specification, uh, but it is an IBM specific uh, extension. Uh, several versions of uh, Node.js are supported, so 0 0.12, uh, 4.x, and 5.x uh, are all supported. Uh, and the operating systems, uh, OSX, Windows, and Linux are the ones that are supported for the micro gateway. So um, uh, if, if you're deploying a micro gateway, um, uh, it's present uh, in the API Connect uh, OVA. Uh, I also mentioned it's also present uh, in the um, NPM uh, API Connect download, if you will. Uh, the essentials uh, says one instance, and what that means is uh, one uh, per API Connect install. Um, you're allowed one provider organization, one developer organization, uh, one catalog, and there's uh, one gateway process per catalog. Uh, you don't get the uh, application management uh, on top of that. Uh, and as we mentioned, uh, professional allows uh, two instances, uh, so essentially uh, two micro gateway processes. I see that's uh, misspelled per catalog. And, and uh, again, it does have uh, some advanced uh, rate limiting, which coordinates between the two instances. So Tim, Tim yes, this is Mike, please. I got a question. So um, you mentioned here that for the on-premise, the micro gateway is part of the API Connect OVA. Um, did, so does that mean, is that essentially the ability to be able to uh, in install the uh, uh, NPM package and pointing it to the uh, the management node once it's uh, once it's stood up. Is, is that what this is referring to? Or um, that's a good question. And uh, there there are a couple of different uh, ways of doing the install. And, and uh, really, I, I I don't have all the information uh, in this presentation. And, and Jeremy is is really the expert at some of that. 
Um, but essentially, the OVA contains uh, everything necessary. Uh, you you may want to get the uh, NPM API Connect install uh, in addition to the OVA, as it does uh, a number of nice things for you, including setting up the, the development environment. Um, but also, it's a it's a pretty straightforward uh, installation. Uh, when you're installing from the OVA, you have to copy files from uh, some locations on the OVA uh, into the system or environment that you wish to execute out of. Um, but yes, it, it uh, is contained uh, within in the OVA. Yeah, because I, I don't know if that actually made GA or not. I don't know if uh, we have some of the folks from uh, uh, from Herd, but we don't have to delay that now. But uh, I just. I just know that with GA, we actually had to install the micro gateway using the uh, the public uh, uh, um, uh, NPM library or NPM repository and install it from there. We, we, I mean, in the original documentation, it said that it was actually part of the, part of that, but it's not. But we, we don't have to uh, delay that now. But I just wanted to let you know that uh, um, I, I don't think this top one made it to GA. Okay. Um, uh, uh, the other piece uh, we, we touched upon is the NPM installation of the API Connect uh, package. So uh, just in invoking that line, npm install-g of API Connect, uh, we'll download off the Internet uh, the whole uh, API Connect uh, laptop experience uh, and install it for you. Um, Next up, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Libra, and I, I think I'll continue to uh, clip the charts. Uh, Libra, are you on by chance? Yes, Tim, can you hear me fine? Yes, I hear you well. Thank you, Libra. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to introduce some of the major components in the micro gateway, and I guess it's important to understand what these underlying components do. So. You know, if there is any error on the gateway uh, in terms of processing the request, you will have better idea when you see the log message indicating which part of the gateway has the problem. So, you know, bear with me. Let me go through the components that we have. Um, so, I guess we will just talk about the diagrams on the right-hand side. So, as Tim just mentioned, uh, the micro gateway is built on top of Node, Express, and the loopback framework. So all these components that you see in this diagram, they are all implemented using pure JavaScript. Okay? Uh, two major components within the micro gateway, right hand side, the data store, left hand side, that's the gateway runtime. And uh, what the data store do is really two things. The very first one, it periodic periodically talk with the API management server and uh, stay synchronized about you know, all the API data, all the product data, all the, you know, plans data that user defined on the API management server. So that's the it's very first important uh, thing to do. Get the data from APIM and, uh, you know, store that in the data store. That's number one. And second thing that it does is it provides data services. Uh, it's a RESTful-based data services. So the different side, the gateway runtime, when he has the needs, you need to figure out how do I process the incoming request. The data inside gateway component send the rest the request to the data store. Hey, give me something specific about this API. So the data inside gateway runtime component can process the incoming API request accordingly. Okay, so that's the right hand side data store. It talk with the API and get the API data, and then you provide a rest for data services for the components in the left-hand side to query against the data, okay? Um, so let's uh, switch to the components in the left-hand side. So the yellow buses that you see over here, they are all Express middleware. So we leverage the Express middleware framework. We chain all these middlewares together sequentially. So when the incoming API request comes in to the gateway, uh, the request will be processed by the middleware one after another, okay? So let me take you through what these middlewares do, okay? So when the request comes in, the very first component that, you know, the request touch on is the UI or rewrite middleware. 
So what it does is to rewrite the incoming URL to make it not contain the organization and to catalog the short names in the URL. That's what the URL rewrite do. And then you pass the control to the context middleware. Um, the context middleware, what it does is to create a context object. And that context object uh, is a transaction-wide data object that can be stored, uh, that, that can be used to store, you know, transactional related information. For example, what's the request body? You know, what's the um, API definition, so on and so forth. So that's that's like a big whiteboard where you can put information and also get information from. Okay. So that's the context middleware. It creates the context object. Then it passes the control to the analytic middleware. So the analytic middleware, what it does is it gather the incoming transaction data and store the API usage information to the configured uh, analytic server in the back end uh, on the API management server side. That's the analytic. Uh, then it passes control to the pre-flow. Uh, that's the most critical components uh, that we have on the gateway. So what the pre flow do is it look at uh, it look at the incoming API request data, including you know uh, headers, URI, so on and so forth, and the send the request to the data store, trying to find out what is the API that I should use to fulfill the incoming API request. Okay, if it finds the API definition that match the incoming request. It also performed the security check and also red limit enforcement. That's what the pre-flow middleware does. If the security check fine, red limit check fine, uh, the pre-flow will pass the request to the next middleware, which is the assembly middleware. And uh, the assembly middleware does is it look at the uh, policy assembly definition that you should define on the API and UI. You know, the flow chart, what's the first step, what's the first policy, what's the second policy, operation switch, so on and so forth. So what the assembly middleware does, it look at the policy assembly and uh, ask you those policies defined by user. Um, then after that, the control will be passed to the post flow and the error handler. So if everything goes fine, the post flow middleware will send the request, the, pro the final process the result back to the API client. And if there was any error during the request processing, the error handler middleware will catch up the error and send the error message back to the client. So that's the you know how how these components end to end work together uh, to process the incoming API request and return to the client. All right. So Tim, I guess we can. Oh, wait a second. So what I just described is the overall components that we have on the micro gateway. And um, you can see the policy assembly flow that we have over here. So um, as the very last bullet in the left-hand side, so when we ship the API connect product, we have some out-of-the-box policies, like invoke, like set variable, um, and also, it, it is possible for user to, you know, create uh, the user-defined policies in the future. Uh, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the very first release, we don't, we are not yet providing the user-defined policy to the BRT yet. No, we are uh, providing user-defined policies. Okay. As, as, as a Sorry beta, I should say, as a beta. Okay. Okay. So I would later. Um, in the later chart, I will talk about you know how do you write the user defined policies. But you know this chart should give you some high level idea of what what are the components that we have on the micro gateway. So Tim, I guess we can go to the next slide. I, I had a question on this slide. Okay. Sure. Uh, this is Dinesh here. Um, so uh, I, I see that there is a data store um, that is a component of the gateway, and my question is, if this is going to receive API requests, can we with the data store in it, can we place this component in the DMZ? Or is it intended to be inside the private? It, it's actually a part of the micro gateway. Um, so the transaction is between the micro
Micro Gateway and the API Manager platform or, plat or server, if you will. So wherever the Micro Gateway resides is where your data store is going to reside. Yeah, but if you if you look at the best practices, what what we usually do is we never post anything. We never put anything, be it a system or a user database components that contain embedded databases. We never put them in the, in the um, in the DMZ. My my question is more architectural than um, you know. I, I just wanted to just think: was this intended to be deployed on the DMZ, or would then would we need to have um, some kind of a DMZ component that receives the request and then forwards it to the Oracle Gateway? Uh, I look at that this is equivalent to a, a data power platform with regard to that question. When when we say data store, it, it's true that it's it's holding uh, um, you know information, but it could be looked at just as a as an on box cache of the artifacts that are present uh, in the API management server, just as, as data power caches information, right? So. Um, yeah, I, I look at the micro gateway as belonging uh, in the DMZ as well. Um, I'm, I'm certainly hmm. open. Uh, Libra, do you have any any other thoughts? Um, yeah, I think the data store here is like you know how uh, data power um, caching the data uh, in its storage. Uh, but in the other hand, you know, data power has some security enforcement done on the box itself, so it's more uh, resilient to the security attraction. So we can put that in the DMZ. Yeah. The okay. Best, so can you share your thoughts on concerns? No. So the concern is if you if you tell me that this is a security hardened um, OVA. Then, then I'm more comfortable. But I've, in places, um, for example, let's let's look at the portal server. The portal server contains a database that it works with, and there have been clients who who positioned this in the DMV, and, and I had to put it back into into the private and secure. I, I'm just wondering whether we have the same situation. If it's a, if it's a DMV hardened component, then it is worthy. Of, of being um, of being in the DMZ, it, but if certainly. not, then we need to look at whether it would be right to put it. Because the reason I'm asking is, whenever when, when, with, with customers, the security teams ask me um, before you put anything in the DMZ, what are the components inside? This happened with one of my customers where they said that, can you have the portal server, the portal um, you know, engine in the DMZ and the web-facing component of that portal server in the um, in, in the DMZ. We need to separate that out. So this is the question that we're going to get on the field. Uh, you make some good points, and, and clearly it's not as as hardened as as data power is, and uh, it is uh, shipped in a source code form, so that source code can be uh, looked at. Um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't get so caught up with the, the data store component itself, but I think the general question of does the micro gateway uh, fit in the DMZ or should it be behind the DMZ uh, is what you're asking, and I, and I think that depends uh, on the security profile that the person is, you know, is holding or comfortable with. Um, I, I suspect after listening to your argument, some people will, would. Um, Definitely prefer this to be behind the DMZ, protected by the DMZ. And uh, Tim, can I add some more comments about sure. the data store? Sure. Um, I guess traditionally people have concern about the data store is it may contain some, say, user data, you know, transactional data. But the data store in this picture is now it doesn't really contain any user registry information, password, things like that. It contains the API definition, like URL pattern. Um, so, 
there is a slight difference over there, but I guess you make a good point. There are some security concerns there that needs to be considered. Right, and that's a point in time statement, Libra. Um, you know, that data store may end up containing key material in the future. All right, good question. I don't think we have a crisp answer, but let me jot it down. And, and uh, we do need to, to think about it and chat with our offering management guys and get a solution. Anything else, Dinesh? No, no. Uh, in the interest of time, let's move on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to work with you offline if, if we need to discuss this more from a, from a field point of view. All right. Good question. Thank you, Dinesh. All right, Tim. So let me continue. So we were going to we are going to talk about the policies a little bit more. So in the middle box, the you know blue little boxes in the middle in the policies assembly for you, you see each box represents a policy and this policy they can really be you know out of the box policies provided by IBM or user defined policies. And uh, Tim, can you uh, go to the next two slides? We can skip next one because these are the middleware description, and I just talked through them, so we won't talk through them again. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So when we talk about policy, we need to talk about the flow engine. So uh, the flow engine is a node JS module. Uh, we use that to ask you a series of tasks, and uh, it, it can also support like you know conditional logic within the flow. So we can say you know, if something happened, then I want to do A. Otherwise, I want to do something else. It, it has that capability. And it also provides the API. Uh, like what you see over here, we have proceed, fail, stop, subscribe, unsubscribe. It allows uh, the task within the flow uh, to interact with the flow engine. The task can tell the flow engine, hey, you know, skip me or go to the next task or, you know, ask you more tasks for me. So this is a very, you know, generic flow engine framework. And uh, the way that we implement it, we want this component to be reusable in some other places. And uh, the flow engine is just used as a component within the micro gateway. We use it to ask you the policies that user defined in the APIM. So, you know, if you look at the micro gateway policies implementation, they are implemented according to the Flow Engine API. And Tim, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to show an example of the policies implementation. Okay, so um, as I discussed, as I introduced earlier, on all these implementation on the micro gateway, they are JavaScript basis. So if you want to, you know, write a policy, so it can be run on the micro gateway and the Flow Engine component, these is the function that you need to implement. So you define the function. Uh, the function takes three parameters, uh, properties, context, and the flow. Uh, properties, they are really the configured information related to this specific policy or this specific task. Okay. In context, we talk about, talk about that in the earlier component diagram. So when a transaction goes through the gateway, the context will hold you know, the intermediate data in this context, and you can, you know, get the information from the context. And flow is really the flow engine component. So what you can see over here is that you can get the logger from the flow object and log a message. Then you can do your own business logic over here. You know, you can get some data from the context, do some processing, you know, put your processing result into the context. And you can also do some subscription to the flow. You can tell the flow engine that hey, flow engine, call me when the flow execution is done. So there could be some finalizing task that can be performed by the task. So, you know, we make these APIs available to um, to user. So if you if user want to implement the custom policy, they can follow the API and, you know, do their custom implementation work about the policy. Okay. So that's the flow engine. Uh, Tim, can we go to the next slide? So 
So this slide we talk about uh, the context variables that we have on the micro gateway. So for those of you who are already familiar with you know earlier version of API and like version four, a lot of these context variables are not new to you. Uh, there are a couple context variables newly introduced in version five, and let me highlight them. Sorry, I didn't uh, highlight the color before. Um, so very first one is the API dot document. Uh, so this context variable really contains the API's regular definition. So if you go to the API connect UI, you can you know define the path, define the operations, uh, define the assembly flow, and all of those they are described in the API's regular. Okay, and that regular information is available within the api.document context variable. So that's something new in version five. And uh, another big piece is, uh, are the message.star variables that you can see in the right hand side, you know, the very last four context variable, including message.body, message.header, message.status call, message.status reason. So the message.body is really the payload that is going to be returned to the API client. So, you know, during the policy processing, each policy, each and every policy, they may or may not update the content within the message that body uh, context variable. And at the end, um, our post flow middleware is going to flush the content within message that body, message that header, message that status call and reason, flush the information back to the client. Okay. So that's something new in version five. Can you let's go to the next slide. A question about these context variables here. Yeah, so Dennis has posted that, and this is the same question I came up with. Are these context variables consistent between the micro gateway and the data power gateway? Yes, so that is the intention. So micro, uh, data power gateway also has the message that body, message that header, status call, and reason. So the answer is yes. If there's an inconsistency, then we we need to fix that. Okay, thanks. Tim, let's go to the next slide. Okay, and um, I think uh, variables on this slide, they are pretty much the same as what we had before, except the request parameters the name. So uh, in the Swagger, you can actually define the parameters associated with an API. Uh, the parameter could reside in header, in path, in curve parameter. And if you want to access those API parameter value, you can access them through request parameters done name. Right? So that's something new in version five. Um, I believe all these context description they are available in the knowledge center. Uh, I'm going to take my words back. They are two specific context variables. Um, the implementation is different between data power and uh, micro gateway. Uh, those two variables, th those two variables are system dot date, system dot date. Let me check. Just one second. I think it's system dot date and the system dot time. Um, so in data power, the system dot date is a string. System dot time is also a string, but a micro gateway system dot date and the system dot time they are JSON objects. So it's a JSON object contains the year, month, day information, hours, time, seconds, things like that. But on data power, they uh, provide the string. That's the only two differences between the um, data power and the micro gateway in terms of the context variables. Okay, so Tim, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, in version five uh, for micro gateway, there are some internal variables. They are also stored in, in the context. And uh, 
we store these internal variables into the context in order to gain better performance because we need to, there are some metadata, we are going to use that for many times during the middleware chain. And we don't want to, you know, query the data store to ask the same information for multiple times. So we store some internal variables in the context. And the naming convention that we have over there is to put them on, in underscore dot something, for example, underscore dot API dot parameters. Okay. And uh, these internal variables, they are not documented and they might be changed in the future, so they should not be used by the customers. Okay. Uh, just a question there, Libra. So you're talking about this because uh, somebody with a with a debugger, for example, could see these variables. Is that correct? Right, right. That's correct. Okay. Thanks, Tim, for the question. Okay, Tim. Let's go to the next slide. So we have so many information in the context variable. How do you access those uh, context variables from API? There are two ways to access them, and again, the way to access the context variable is the same between data power and the micro gateway. So the first way to access that is to access the context variable in the you know policy assembly flow in the UI. So you know on API and UI you drag and drop and invoke policy to the flow, and uh, you want to access a specific context variable. In this example, what you see over here is target URL. What you need to do is to put the dollar sign and parentheses in front of that variable name. Okay, that's how you do that. Um, that's how you do it if you want to access the context variable on the UI. And uh, on Micro Gateway, um, it has a JavaScript policy. You can write JavaScript uh, call snippet and then the Micro Gateway to run the JavaScript snippet for you. And uh, the way that you access that within the JavaScript is simply use the variable name or using the getter method. Okay, so in this example, you can see that we set the target URL to HTTPS w3.ibn.com, and you can also you know use the set method. And line four, line five on the right hand side, you can see the you know, access to the context variable directory or using the get method. That's two way to access the context variables. Okay, so uh, Tim, I think that pretty much covers what I want to you know share with the audiences over here. All right, uh, good stuff, Libra. Thank you. Uh, any, any questions for Libra on context variables or the overall structure of the micro gateway? <coughs> Yeah, if you have questions, go ahead and hit star one and chime in. Going once. Okay. Go ahead and carry on. Thank you. Thank you, Libra. Um, next up, I think we have Dan Bott. Uh, Dan, are you on? I'm on. Dan, go ahead. Okay. Um, you can control it if you want. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to give an overview of how security works on the micro gateway and then in particular the client ID and client secret aspects of that. Um, if you're familiar with API management v4 or v5, this is probably going to look pretty familiar to you. Um, it's, it's probably about 95% the same. Um, so I'm going to start out by giving an overview of how Swagger 2.0 security works. Um, I'm going to talk about how the micro gateway implements that, and then I'm going to go over how the API designer um, allows you to configure it both in the design and the source view, and then I was going to talk about um, particularly some aspects of the client ID and client secret usage. Okay, next slide. So the micro gateway uses uh, Swagger 2.0 for its security. Um, as Libra just mentioned, it's, it operates in the uh, preflow uh, component. So if you're familiar with Swagger 2.0 security, um, it basically def defines three different types of objects. Uh, the first is known as a security definition, which declares uh, security schemes that are available that you can use. 
Um, those are always at the API level. So basically, this is sort of your library or your palette of available um, security schemes that, that you can use later on in the security requirements. Uh, the security schemes, they're individual components within this uh, security definitions, and they define the, uh, the characteristics of um, the security um, definition. And then the third component is the actual security requirements. These are actually what get executed or enforced at runtime, and those are just things that are declared in the security definitions. So if you look on the right, I have an example of the YAML um, that would appear in the Swagger document. Um, you can see in the in the pink or the the pink is the, are the security definitions. There's two. Um, security schemes in there, one for the client ID header and one for the secret. And then below in the blue is the actual uh, security requirements, and those are the things that, that get executed. And those are just basically the names of the security schemes. So um, Swagger also defines three types of security schemes, um, API key, those are there's two types of those. There's um, header values in the URL header, and also, um, I mean, in the, in the request header, and then there's um, query parameters in the URL. Um, the example on the right uses headers. And uh, the second kind of security scheme is basic authentication, which is username and password. The third type is OAuth. And um, there's four types that um, Swagger defines implicit password, application, and access code. So next slide. So I'm going to describe here the, uh, the how, my, how the micro gateway enforces um, the Swagger security types um, for, for uh, authorization enforcement. For the API key, um, there's it basically there's there's two things that it can enforce um, the client ID and the client secret. Um, they have fixed values for the query parameters. It's client underscore ID and client underscore secret. For headers, it's it's the user or the custom defined XIBM client ID, XIBM client secret. Those are currently fixed. That might change in the future. Um, but for now, if you use any, anything besides those names, they, they won't work. Um, basic authentication, I'm not going to talk about that a whole lot because uh, the next presentation is going to go into detail on that. And for OAuth, um, in the current uh, implementation of Micro Gateway, we do not support OAuth 2. So if there's any OAuth 2 requests that come through, they're automatically denied. And that will probably change in the future. And that's a difference between um, the micro gateway and the data power edge gateway. Okay, next slide, please. So here's the API designer design view for um, security definitions. Um, like I said before, the, the parameter names, this is for headers, the parameter names are fixed. The, the names, you can type in whatever you want, but this is how you would set up, set up the security definitions. Um, and this is for API key. Um, next slide. And this is the design view for the security requirements. Basically what it does is um, it gives you a list of all your security definitions and you just either select them or unselect them depending on what you want to enforce. And current, in the current um, release of API Manager or API Connect, um, there's a discrepancy between what's available through the UI and what's available through the Swagger document itself. The, the UI only supports a single security requirement whereas the Swagger um, specification allows um, a multiple security requirements to be defined and so that um, one or more can, can be enforced. 
Um, if you want to do that, you can't use the, the UI. You have to use the, uh, the source view. So next, next slide, please. And here's an example of that. What I've done here is, in addition to the two API keys that I had defined before, if you notice on line 853, I defined a basic auth um, security definition. And on line 869, you can see that I've added it to the security requirements. And the way the security requirements work in Swagger is it's basically an array of security requirements. So the fact that basic auth is in its own um, array element means that its, its enforcement is independent of the, of the other array elements, in other words, independent of the client ID and client secret. So the way that it would work is um, you would, if a request come in, it would have to match either the ID header and the ID and secret headers, or it could match the, um, the basic auth. Either, if either of those pass, then um, the, the request would be let through. And so on line 869, if that little dash before basic auth was missing, that would basically mean it's part of the overall of the same security requirement um, as, as the client ID and client secret. And that would mean L3 would have to pass. It's a subtle difference, um, but if, if, if you want more information, you know, look at the, at the Swagger at the Swagger specification. Okay, uh, next slide. So with the previous um, security requirement, here's here's a curl command that you could use to um, actually um, get it through. Since it was defining um, the client ID and client secret through headers, you just use a dash H to specify whatever your uh, defined client ID and client secret is. And um, the actual client ID and client secret values, they're stored in the subscription models. Um, the secret is stored in a, in a base64 encoded SHA-256 hashed version. You can see in the red block there what, what, the client, what a client ID and client secret um, actually look like. And the developer toolkit, by default, it gives the values um, of the ID of, of default and secret is um, secret in all caps. And that corresponds to the curl command up, up at the top. So. so, Dan, let me just add something quick. Uh, so if you're playing with the developer toolkit, um, as he described, uh, there's a, a default client ID and a default secret. We don't have different subscribers, and so we wanted a kind of a, a, um, a hard-coded version that people could test with. So that's that's why we uh, have the client ID of default and client ID of se or client secret of secret, um, just so that you can test. Sorry for the interruption, Dan. No, that's fine. Um, that's all I had. All right. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, in, any questions for Dan on uh, uh, kind of general security or client ID and client secret? If not, uh, let's go ahead. Um, thank so, you, Dan. So just a uh, confirmation. I, I saw on the two slides, one said, uh, well, it's two and there's the four grand types, and then the second slide saying OAuth 2 is not supported. So uh, can, can you please clarify? So in the definitions, you can you can just define your OAuth 2 security requirements, and even you can even um, include them in, in your Swagger document, you know, in the security requirements. It's just that on the micro gateway, they're not going to be enforced because we don't support it. So if if any OAuth two requests come in, they're just gonna they're just gonna fail the authentic the authorization. 
Yeah, so Dan was going through what the, the Swagger document allows, but the micro gateway does not support OAuth 2. Right, at this time. and the thing that you have to understand is that you know the UI is shared with the Edge gateway, which does support um, OAuth 2. So if, if you know, in theory you could use the same Swagger document for either one, but if if you if you're using it under the micro gateway, then the OAuth 2 is just going to fail a request. Okay, thanks. Other questions? All right, thank you, Dan. Oh, there's one more. I'm sorry, we have one more question. Okay. So, uh, you, you mentioned that the Swagger uh, 2.0 supports O2. So let's assume that the customer is like uh, O2 uh, re um, uh, requirement. Can we just like define O out and the, the micro gateway will support that? No? Are you um, asking if we'll support it at some point in the future? Or are you asking if it supports o the original OAuth versus OAuth 2? It doesn't support original either. OAuth, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't support either one. All right, thanks. All right, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, so next up, uh, 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 sorry, I have one uh, additional question on that. Sorry, I was trying to get in. Um, okay. When when we generate the swagger that we're going to send up to the managed environment, um, you know, that actually runs the data power gateways, um, <clears throat> are we saying that once it gets up there, those um, hard coded uh, client ID and client secret IDs must be changed? Well, normally in a, in a production environment, you would have your own subscription that defines the values that you want. So, yeah, yes, you would definitely want to change those and not leave. Well, it's right, just, just in the request itself. So if, if you're running um, on the toolkit, then that client ID with the ID of default and the secret of secret uh, will be allowed through. Um, but if you were running uh, that same swagger on a data power appliance, uh, then you would have all of the real client IDs and client secrets, and they would be um, validated uh, against the APIM database. Right, and we, we just have to make sure that, you know, if we have API creators um, working in their locals, we have to make sure that they uh, either regenerate, you know, change their keys out or make sure that the that, that they're using real keys otherwise they're going to get errors that's all I'm trying to get to yeah this, I don't think that applies yeah. here but I don't think that applies here because when you're in the toolkit environment you're going to be creating the APIs and possibly even the plans and publishing them but you're not really publishing subscriptions and so you really don't I mean you if you're in the toolkit environment you're going to use that secret equal secret and you're going to use the client ID as of default and yeah, definitely, you don't want to be using that in production. It's going to fail. Right. Um, okay. That, that that was what I wanted to make sure was that there was an actual check to make sure that teams didn't stumble over that. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, next up is John Balesa. John, are you on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Go ahead. All right. Uh, actually, it looks like uh, the formatting is a little messed up. Do you want to go ahead and just share uh, my screen? Is that yeah, possible? Let me, let me back out. Oh, sorry about that. Um, you need to raise your hand, and then uh, John can Yeah, I'll, I'll make yeah. you a presenter. Or Michael can. Sorry. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, John, you are a presenter now. Uh, all right. Is it uh, shown on my screen here? No. It's. Did you click the share, oh. uh, the start sharing button? There we go. All right. I think I got that. Oh, okay. I see something happening. Okay. okay cool. I got it. Yeah. All right. So uh, for the the basic authentication um, uh, features here is basically just the the typical username and password authentication. Um, that's found in, you know, uh, just basic HTTP auth. 
So uh, it, you know, essentially just requires that the um, uh, the uh, users, the client supply a username and password uh, encoded in Base64 in an authorization header. Um, so it looks something like this, where it's the authorization indicates that it's basic and then provides the, the Base64 encoding. Um, and so I'm sure everyone here is probably aware of how this stuff works, but just worth mentioning that it, you know, this doesn't actually provide any sort of secrecy, so it's always, you know, important to, to do this over TLS. Um, so basically uh, what happens then uh, once the micro gateway receives a uh, request uh, to an API that is uh, supposed to be secured with basic uh, auth, uh, it looks in, um, as, as, uh, as uh, prescribed in the, the security definition for the API, um, it looks in uh, the request headers for the uh, this authorization header. Um, if it doesn't find it, it immediately fails. Um, but then if it does find it, it proceeds. Um, and so the, the way that it, it goes forward in terms of actually authenticating, um, well, there are basically two, uh, two uh, methods for actually uh, providing the, the authentication on, on the back end. So you can provide either with an authentication URL service, uh, which is basically just uh, more or less proxying an authentication request over HTTP or, you know, ideally HTTPS, um, or uh, it could be secured with LDAP, um, which also LDAP over TLS um, is provided. So. Um, so the way that actually happens on the uh, on, in the micro gateway is we basically look at the, the security definitions. Um, here's two examples of, of what they might look like. Um, in, and basically we look and see, based on the authentication URL, uh, we just look at the, uh, the protocol prefix for the, for the authentication URL to determine uh, whether we're using LDAP or HTTP for the authentication URL. Um, and then uh, in the case of authentication URL, uh, there'll be a TLS profile name uh, available in the in, as a uh, parameter on the authentication URL uh, property. Um, and then in LDAP, uh, we have basically the same authentication URL property, uh, provides the, the uh, uh, location of the LDAP server. And one thing I forgot to uh, include on the slide here is, uh, and, it, and Dan had it in his examples before, um, was an XIBM authentication registry property. And uh, basically what that is uh, doing is providing the, the uh, name of the registry where the LDAP configuration is. So there's a lot of stuff that's basically missing from here that you would need to actually complete an LDAP uh, 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 transaction that's actually provided by the registry, and that's in the, the registry name, uh, uh, reference via a registry name and security definition. Um, so just go in a little deeper on the authentication URL uh, first. Um, it's, it's basically what it sounds like. It's just proxying uh, incoming requests, um, uh, just at least the authentication so it, it gets to this point in the authentication step, and uh, it will um, basically send the same authentication or the authorization header to, in a new request to a backend um, uh, URL, authentication URL service. Uh, and if that comes back with the 200 uh, OK, then we say that then the, the client is authenticated and the request can proceed uh, through the processing of, on the micro gateway. Um, otherwise, if, you know, typically, if, and well, if, if the authentication fails, it'll be a 401 that we get in response from the authentication URL service, uh, and so we would respond with the 401 uh, in that case too. In general, um, if, if any error occurs in the in the authentication process, um, uh, we respond to the client with the 401 uh, just to to maintain um, uh, compatibility with data powers operations. So. Um, so, uh, moving forward into LDAP, uh, the, um, the, when, when doing LDAP authentication, we have several different methods. Um, uh, just 
uh, as a little bit of background on LDAP itself, it, you know, it's basically a, a directory uh, a database that's a, um, that allows, you know, basically user records to be identified with distinguished names, which, you know, is basically the, the, the unique name for a particular re uh, record. So <clears throat> there's several ways that we have a, of interacting with the backend LDAP server. Um, which we call, you know, search DN, compose DN, or compose UTN. Uh, search DN is basically if you, you know, you're provided with the username, uh, but you don't necessarily know all of the, uh, the parts of the distinguished name, uh, you can request that the, that the LDAP, uh, ser uh, server search through the records, uh, uh, and, and provide you with the records that match. And then if a uh, match is found, then you basically attempt to bind to the LDAP server with that distinguished name and the provided password. And uh, that's basically the, the process of performing the authentication is, is more or less logging in to the LDAP server with those credentials. Um, and, and uh, you know, so if the login has been failed, then you say the, that the client failed to authenticate. Um, now, uh, the next, uh, method is the compose uh -huh. DN. So in uh -huh. that case, you will be aware of the of how uh, the the full distinguished name uh -huh. is formed and all that is missing. Uh, ahead of time is the username, so you just simply fill in the blank and attempt to bind. So it's very straightforward. Uh, and then finally is uh, compose U UPN. And this is basically uh, what Active Directory does, is, is how you would uh, interact with Active Directory. Um, and so, like I mentioned, it's similar to compose the end. Um, so you you uh, basically uh, will have a uh, a format that the UPN, which stands for um, uh, oh, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm blanking on that. It's a user. Um, uh, I can't I can't remember off the top of my head what it stands for, but it's it's basically uh, sort of specific to the the Active Directory uh, setup. Um, and and it, it doesn't actually form a, a valid uh, DN, so there's some some sort of you know it, it's sort of unique to Active Directory or, or in, in uh, setups based on it. But basically, it, it you you attempt to bind to a UPN with the provided credential, and then if a, if that bind is successful, then you, there's a further step of checking uh, um, group membership um, to make sure that the uh, that the uh, um, uh, credentials are valid for a uh, particular uh, naming context, is how it's referred to in, in um, uh, Active Directory and, and LDAP. So, uh, and so those are basically the three uh, authentication methods for LDAP available, and those uh, are basically configured within the, the LDAP configuration um, to correspond to how the, the backend LDAP server is expecting to, to perform. Uh, the authentication. So, um, so that that about does it on the basic off. Uh, were there any questions uh, that you want to discuss on the air right now? Yeah, and there, uh, were, uh, there were a couple of questions on the uh, in the meeting stream. Uh, the first one is mutual. Oh, is it yes. Or all that bad? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, basically the. Um, the the TLS profile name is provided in the LDAP configuration. Um, so I'm assuming that's what you mean. Is is can we verify the uh, you know the um, authenticate the the back the LDAP server and and that that is the case. Yeah, you can you have the option of not doing that, but it is it is a, a capability that we have um, based on the TLS profile um, that that would be referenced from within the uh, LDAP configuration. Um, does that answer that question? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, let's, I let's go on to the next. Uh, I, yeah. I think you did answer it pretty well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, okay. yeah. okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll move forward. Um, and then uh, regarding caching, there's there's not LDAP caching right now uh, that can be added in uh, with that probably too much trouble. Um, anyway, uh, moving forward to to the cores uh, section. So cores is 
uh, you know, cross-origin resource sharing that basically um, uh, is a way of allowing APIs to explicitly declare um, uh, how uh, basically external referral origins can, can access or invoke client requests on, on an API. So it allows uh, um, the API to define what external, you know, which of external origins they initiate a request by a client, the methods that they can call with cross-origin requests, and then custom, which custom headers are allowed on those on those requests. And and basically, what's happening is it's it's selectively relaxing the same origin policy, um, you know, so that you can have a little more robust uh, uh, functionality. And uh, just to, to clarify, an origin is specified by the protocol host and port that's being requested. So all three of those have to be the same uh, in order to not run into cores issues. But then if you any one of those changes, then you, you start running into a cores policy. So there's in cores, there's this notion of pre-flighted requests. And that's basically where uh, before you do a certain type of request, you have to make uh, the client will automatically issue a uh, another request with an options method. And this occurs whenever uh, uh, you know one of the three following conditions is met. So any request with a custom HTTP header will invoke an, uh, a pre-flight request. Um, any uh, request that uses methods other than get, head, or post. Or uh, finally, any post request that has a non-standard um, content type, so specifically one that's not the uh, um, uh, encoded a URL encoded form, a multi-part form data, or just plain text. And and one important thing to note is that all pre-flight requests occur within without any authentication data, and basically occur before authentication takes place. So that's uh, an important part about the architectural considerations here. Um, and so basically what happens, the, the, the core of what we do for core support in the micro gateway is primarily about handling these pre-flight requests. Um, because, mainly because they, it, it, it has to happen before authentication occurs, which means that we can't just allow an options request through to the back end to allow um, the the uh, um, you know the, the the API that we're crossing to uh, handle it because it hasn't actually met you know authentication yet. So basically, what we do is by default we we enable core support for all APIs and the um, uh, that we are crossing, although you can explicitly disable it. And the requests the cores enabled APIs. Um, are handled as following. This applies to all all of the requests. So if if the API explicitly supports a request method, so any any you know it could be get, post, or anything like that, basically not a pre flight um, request, uh, we'll go ahead and add default cores headers to the pending response, and then continue processing that request. When the back end responds uh, to to the request that we've proxied will add the response headers uh, and overwrite any of the default headers that we've put. So that's just a, a, a clear baseline you know, way of, of, of sticking this in. But the, the real trick is with pre-flight requests, if the, if the API does not explicitly support the options request, then we will basically catch that and respond with the default course headers and stop processing immediately. And so on the right here, I've listed basically what those uh, uh, default headers are. And so they are sort of conditional based on what's provided by the request. So for instance, if the, um, if the request head, uh, provides an origin header, we'll actually add that as the, the allowed origin. Um, otherwise, if it doesn't provide that, we just say that it's a wild card. Um, then the allowed headers, basically if the uh, request headers from, are from a pre-flight request and provide the, the uh, allowed headers, we just add those. And then um, if not, we just uh, respond with an empty string. Um, then we expose the following headers just from uh, uh, internal, um, you know, uh, that might be relevant to the client. Um, uh, 
various headers that might be uh, allowed or provided. Um, and then in the allow methods, uh, it, those are those that are specified by the swagger definition. Um, so just uh, those that, that we actually have support for processing, in other words. And then finally, the allow credentials. Basically, if it's if the allowed origin from the first uh, uh, header is the wildcard, then we don't allow credentials on that. But if it specifies a specific origin, then we uh, do allow credentials. So that's, uh, that basically sums up the core support. Any other questions? Uh, there was a, a general question. Uh, are TLS profiles the same for DP and micro gateway? I, I believe so. Um, I believe that's the case. Yeah. Thomas, what, what, what is your thought there? Are they the same or are they similar? Yeah, we're actually pulling the, in the situations where we're s supporting a TLS profile, we're actually pulling it from the API manager. Okay. So, but it Thanks. is worthy to note that the TLS profiles are not supported in the. Uh, Developer experience. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> my internet well, just crashed on me, so I don't know. I tried to hand back control. Um, I don't know if it worked though. I think it did. All right. Good yeah. Day. As soon as you, yeah. As soon as you stop sharing it, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You tell me, got it. Okay. It automatically yeah. crashes the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a value added feature. <laughs> Make sure. It's Get out. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, okay. Uh, I, I did have a question uh, yep, with regard to uh, after processing the basic authentication, uh, does the header being stripped out from the request before it flowing out to the backend? It's really a question for Dan Bot. Do the authentication headers get stripped out? So it does, right? I, I I don't know. Yeah, um, Libra, do you know? I I, I don't think uh, they actually, do. Allie or Libra may know because uh, in the invoke policy is it will you know will makes the decision on whether that policy or I mean whether that header gets included and in, and in what makes it to the back end. So the current behavior is that every request, every header that comes in from the request from the original request. They are going to be copied into message data headers. That's the context variable that we discussed earlier on. So everything from the request will be copied to there. And if there is no processing, um, say, for example, if after doing the basic authentication, it removes the basic auth header from message data headers, then it will remain there. And that will be, of course, propagate to the backend system. So we think that it will be propagated unless you take some action, for example, in the JavaScript action to remove it, correct? That's right. Yep. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, let's go on. Uh, Allie, uh, well, actually, let me, let me wait for a second. Um, Michael, do you want to stop the recording and start another recording, or should we just continue? No, press on. We're good. Okay. Um, Allie? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I hear you, but I just got there. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, if we, um, so can if we you start? could also, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll need you to speak up just a tad so we can get it on the recording. Thank you. Can you see that, Allie? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, so now we are talking about the policies. In a, in the assembly, uh, policies are used to perform different tasks, and one of the most important policies is the invoke. The invoke policy is used to call an API server via HTTP or HTTPS. User can add and edit the invoke policy from the assembly UI. Check the screenshot in the right hand side. There is only one policy in the assembly flow. By clicking the 
invoke policy. User can enter the information like target URL, uh, the HTTP verb, timeout, and the basic authentication. And uh, the TLS profile then for creating a secure connection with the API server. Uh, next slide. Uh, the invoke policy writes the API request with the headers and body that are read from the two context variable, uh, message body and message headers. Uh, therefore, users should populate the body and headers that are going to be written to the API server before execution of the invoke policy. Uh, when the API response returns, the invoke policy saves the header, body, data code, and reason phrase in the four context variables respectively. Um, body and headers are saved under the uh, under the message. Code and reason are saved under the message dot status by default. This data can be read or manipulated by any other policy that follows the invoke policy. If users don't like the API response to override the message body, they can specify some other context variable to, to store the response. Check the output property in the, of the invoke policy in the YAML example. Uh, next slide. Uh, if the API server requires the connection to be established over HTTPS, a TLS, TLS profile must be provided to the invoke policy. User can create their TLS, TLS profiles in the admin console. A TLS profile should contain information like the CA certificate of the API server, the TLS version, and the application's party key and certificate. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, we are going to talking about the conditional policy. An assembly flow can, may contain one or more policies. There are two conditional policies that can be used to, to do the conditional processing. One is the operation switch and the other is the if policy. The operation switch can execute alternative policy assemblies based on the operation ID or the verb and path pair. With the, uh, with the operation switch, the assembly developer can explicitly specify the assemblies to be executed for different operations. However, the operation switch doesn't provide a default case. Uh, the if policy can execute a portion of assembly when a given condition is evaluated as true. A condition can be any valid JavaScript, uh, JavaScript expression. Therefore, with the if policy, the assembly developers can test a context variable and execute one or more policies if only if the condition is tested as true. We need to note the if policy doesn't provide the L. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, an assembly is a flow that contains policies, one after another. In, uh, in a flow, there is no branch. So to support the conditional processing, uh, Operation switch is used here. In this example, you can see different policies up are applied to different operations. For the operation of getting an account, an invoke and a JavaScript policy are executed. For the operation of creating an account, another invoke is executed. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's the YAML of the operation switch policy in the last page. First, let, uh, uh, first, 
uh, what is an operation? Operation is uh, operations are defined in the SWAG document. See the SWAG document in the right hand side. There are two operations. One is read account and the other is create account. Operations are basically the combination of HTTP method and the, the endpoint. So so user can refer to an operation by its operation ID or the pair of HTTP, HTTP method and the endpoint. So uh, check the example in the left hand side. Two cases are found in the operation switch. One is for reading the existing account matched by the verb and past, past pair. And the other is creating a new account matched by the operation ID. Uh, when creating a new account, the the basic authentication is required for the invoke policy, and the after that, a JavaScript is active for further processing. Uh, next slide. <coughs> Uh, when the operation switch can only support the conditional processing by operations, the if condition uh, the if policy is more flexible in that any condition that can be written in JavaScript expression is supported. So when a given condition is fulfilled, the specified policy will be applied. This is an example that if policy is used to used for parameter checking. There are three. There are three if policies used in a flow in this assembly. Assembly. The first is test whether the request header SQT S quantity is a valid integer. If not, an invalid quantity error is shown. If the quantity is valid, the other two if policies are tested whether the quantity is bigger or smaller than 100. And then we can process the two cases use, use different JavaScript policies. Uh, uh, please note that the request headers are parsed and processed in, in the uh, pre-flow. So the header names are already converted into lower cases. And the header values are stored in strings, string values. So here we need to call the JavaScript function pass int, and it's not a number to examine the lowercase s quantity as a number in the condition expression. Okay. Uh, next slide. So. From the previous example, we see that the policy, the policies may throw errors at wrong time. Uh, every every error is an object with a required name and uh, an optional message. For example, the invoke policy may throw a property error if the if the verb is not valid, or uh, or or it may throw a connection error when the API server is not responding. Such errors can be handled in the cache, cache section of the assembly by their names, or developers can just use the default case to catch any uncode error. Uh, the execute uh, the assembly will not be resumed even after the cache assembly is finished. Oh, next slide. Uh, user can add catches. Uh. Oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Okay. Users can add catch cases as many as they like. In this example, we create only one case for handle both of the invalid quantity error and the insufficient stack. For these two errors, a JavaScript policy and a uh, set variable policy are executed for, for handling the problems. Uh, in addition, there is also a default case to handle the other uncoded errors. 
it contains only one set variable policy. Mm, next slide. A question there, Ali. What is the so there's a catch clause that's defined, and then there's also a a default. What what is the default versus the catch? Is that um, error handling? Yes, they are error handling. So in in this uh, in this error handling section, you can add as many catch as you like. Uh, and uh, you can have the optional default for any other untold errors. I see. So the catches are for specific errors that you want to process, and the default is for anything else, any other error. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe a, a name like catch all versus default might be better here. I, this is me speaking, but it's a, default doesn't seem intuitive here. All right. So, so on this part, uh, uh, the catch phrases for invalid quantity error and the insufficient stock, I, and I understand that invalid quantity error is being explicitly specified in the flow. So where does that the insufficient stock, how, how did you know use that name? Uh, uh, most um, different policies can throw different errors. For example, uh, the involved policy, it can throw property error or connection error. These two errors here, invalid quantity error and insufficient stack, they are thrown by a, a, a throw policy or JavaScript policy. They are special, so they are custom policy. With the with the throw policy, you can throw a you can throw an error with of you, of you, of a name you specify, a custom name. So, uh, so you so can the, see. So if I might, uh, so the, the JavaScript, one of these JavaScript policies could throw insufficient stock. Um, so yes. you, you knew from writing that policy that that was one of the errors that could be thrown. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It does. I, okay, so is that just the name that we need to use in the catchphrase? Is that case sensitive? I guess it, it is. Um, I guess I'm not sure whether Chris Bygrave or any other uh, folks from uh, the EPIM UI side can answer that question. I recall there was a discussion like, you know, for every policy, it actually has a YAML file defines the contract. Uh, of the policy, and that contract also provides the definition about what errors the policy could be thrown. And UI actually used that definition to figure out, you know, if user would like to catch that error, what, what are the errors are applicable over there? Um, I remember remember that was there was a discussion over there, but I'm not sure whether it was implemented in the GA code or not. Um, Ali, for the the question is uh, is it case sensitive the name of the uh, caught error? Yes, it's case sensitive. Okay. Yeah, so I guess I guess the uh, uh, thanks, uh, Libra. I think the uh, so when you define that catchphrase, do you get a a drop down list of selecting what error you want to catch, or you just type it in? Ali, do you know? Uh, yes, we have a drop drop down list for the for for the most of the errors. So, however, for some custom errors, they are not in the drop down list. So you have to type it yourself. Okay. For example, okay. you can use a you can use a throw policy to throw a custom error of your own. So only you know the name of the custom error. So they will be they will not be in the drop down list. Okay, see. All right. Okay. Uh other questions? So Chris Bygrave, uh star one should do it. Does that work for you? Chris, did you want to weigh in? Uh, yes it does. I was trying to star six. That's what the uh, doc said. 
Chris, did you want to comment on uh, the uh, error names? Um, yeah, there was there was conversations about the gateway policies clearly defining what errors they throw, but um, nothing was ever done on that. So, so, I don't so have if information so, available. so if it's defined in the YAML defining that policy, then it would show up in the drop down. Is that correct? No, no, that was the uh, conversation we were having, but um, nothing was ever decided on that. So I don't have any. Yeah, yeah that was that was postponed from from V5 GA. Okay. So that's the intent post GA, but we didn't get to implement it. So in the drop down, you should only have the hard coded ones that we know that the current out of box policies provide, and you can enter any other ones by typing the names themselves. And then I've got a piece of work on me for the UI so that it um, also puts um, any custom throws and uh, assembly flow in there as well, but I haven't got to that piece yet. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris and William, for weighing in. Um, any other questions before we go on? All right, Ali, uh, go ahead. On this slide. Okay. Uh, in this YAML, two if policy are used for the parameter checking. The first one checks the, if the S quantity header is a valid number, and the other the, the other one checks if it is less than 10. If not, the last import policy will not be executed. Instead, the throw policies are executed to throw the custom arrows, the invalid quantity and insufficient stack. So you can see in the catch section, one case is added for these two errors. When they are told, the message body and message status are populated with the error details. So a, a 400 response will be returned to the client. As for the other errors, a 500 response will be returned. Uh, will be returned. So that's all. Any other questions for Ali? Okay. All right, thank you, thank you, Ali. Uh, next up, uh, we've got uh, Gary Tu, who's going to take us through uh, the set variable uh, policy. Gary, are you on? Gary, you'll need to hit star one to come off of mute. Uh, Gary still cannot hear you. Um, maybe uh, we should uh, come back to that section. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Gary, we hear you now. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the set variable policy actually is very pretty uh, straightforward. It, it provides the ability to manipulate the context variable. For example, the message head, the message body that, uh, provide, uh, that is presented uh, previously that by by Ali. Um, and actually, there are three uh, different type of action for for this policy. That uh, the first one that is uh, you can set the va va value to to the context variable, and uh, or you can add you can append value to the variable. That um, the value. Uh, the value of that variable will be converted to array if it is not array already. So that if we, but if oh dear, I think uh, we lost you again, Gary. Um, uh, uh, still there, Gary? Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Now, now we hear you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Some problem in my phone. That it got to the theory mode. Okay, we just heard you talk about the add, add action. Yeah. Okay. Um, it will append uh, the value to to an array, and oh, oh, if if there is no, if uh, there already an object that and uh, that the, the value is not an array, that will convert it to to an array, and uh, the the existing value will be the first element, and uh, the value added will be the the last one. That is one, and the third up action is that you can delete the va the variable from the context. That you can clear it, clear it. Um, and the type of the value that you can assign is uh, 
is string, number, boolean, or integer. Or uh, the other way to do that is you can uh, put a string that as a placeholder um, uh, that uh, dollar sign and variable in, in within the parentheses. Um, and uh, the value the value of the placeholder will be replaced with the value uh, of full bar for, for this example. Next slide, please. Um, this one that I present uh, to you the example that how to use the set variable that you can, for example, that the first action that you can set message headers, X text headers, um, a value to the header, and the, the second that you can append um, the, a value to the same header. So that in the result that the header, the message header start X text header that will be uh, array that with bus bus and pro. And uh, the 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 last action uh is clear. Uh X header header message that header star X remove header that so this header will be removed from the header in the response. If if you got with the header from from the backend, you can you can uh delete it uh in in the set variable policy. Um, I think that's it. Uh, do, you, do you have any question for that? Uh, any questions on the set variable policy? Yeah. So, so if if the uh, if the variable is already a array, can you set a, a entire new array value? Yes. Uh, you, you you cannot set in, in uh, from the UI. Actually, you cannot um, set it the entire array. In UI, can always set uh, the the primitive primitive value, primitive type of value. But actually, like if you have the the custom JavaScript policy, uh, you can uh, set it in JavaScript in array. Okay. Right. Uh, other questions? All right. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, so there there are some um, questions in the meeting stream, Tim. Okay, can you read them? I, I can't see them. Sure. Uh, Shufan asks, can the value be a variable? Can the value be a variable? So I think... Uh, yeah, so I think you can do like these placeholders, like you see here, this dollar foo dot bar, where you're, you're effectively moving... Um, a value from one place to another. Yes, uh, the, uh, you would replace with the value uh, of foot bar from the context of, of, of the concept value of foot bar. And uh, if it is primitive value, it would be just copy. And if it is the, the value is an array, it would, just, it would be a reference. Okay. What else you got? Uh, yeah, so there's a can you create a new variable? And, uh, yeah, yes, you, you, when you call set or add, it will be, if, if the variable does not exist, it will be, uh, will be created. Right. And it's important to note here that the, um, the, there's a set variable for the edge gateway as well, and the behavior should, should be uniform between the two. Is that correct? Yep. Yes, it is uniform. Other questions on the list, Thomas? Uh, I don't see any. Um, yeah, I think I think we've got it covered. All right, let's go ahead. Thank you, Gary and Thomas. Um, okay, let, let's go on. So next up uh, is basic analytics, and to present that, uh, we have uh, Yi Hong. Uh, Yi Hong, are you on by chance? Um, yes, Tim, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Go ahead, Yi Hong. Okay. Um, I think if uh, you are familiar with the Edge Gateway, uh, you all know that we have a HTTP uh, log policy. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have the HTTP log policy in Micro Gateway uh, at this release. So we have some uh, basic, we, we still need to support the API analytics features so we implement some basic analytic functions here uh, inside the uh, micro gateways 
Um, so it uh, is just uh, gathering the best uh, statistics, statistics uh, and send to the Elasticsearch servers. So uh, here uh, it's not a uh, official policy yet. So um, you will see uh, when Libra introduced uh, the components of the micro gateway, you will see uh, analytics middleware there. Um, uh, we implement the basic analytics right now as a uh, middleware right now. So um, and so it, it's not a policy yet. So you you are not able to uh, drag and drop the uh, 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 analytics policy inside the uh, editor right now. And uh, it only uh, uh, publish or uh, submit the basic API usage to the Elasticsearch server. Uh, so far, um, I think uh, the activity log uh, policy in the edge gateway support uh, uh, a different level of the login, but right now we only uh, support the basic uh, uh, login uh, in this uh, release. And uh, the important thing is uh, this feature is only available in the management uh, micro gateway, so it's not available in the desktop experience right now. So um uh, if you are using a different work toolkit, uh you uh there will no uh analytics uh, activity there. Okay. And so uh we do the implementation of the analytics uh in uh different mode. Uh we uh publish the data in timer and batch mode, which means uh, um if the time hits uh, for example, three seconds, and within the three seconds, there's only uh, three uh, transactions, and we will pop, uh, push these three transactions activity log to the uh, database search. Or if the, if uh, within the three seconds, and there are, for example, like 50 transactions, and you hit the quarters of the uh, upper bound, so we will uh, submit these. 50 transactions activity log at once uh, to the identity search. So we implement the, uh, the publishing timer and batch mode. And uh, you will send to the, uh, the, the URLI uh, uh, list here. And the first, the API managers actually will be replaced at a long time. And uh, as I mentioned, it's a, a middleware that, uh, right after the context creation. So uh, every transaction uh, after the context will be logged. And uh, it is enabled by setting the API merger environment variable. So, uh, and this environment variable is only set uh, in the management node. And currently, we are not able to partially turn on or turn off the uh, basic analytic feed functions. So uh, once uh, you start micro gateway in the management node, then the, this feature is turned on and you are not able to turn off it. But it only publishes the basic uh, statistics. Okay, I think can we go to the next page? Oh, hold on, I got a question here. So. What, here's what I got out of this slide here. So analytics are not enabled yet for the desktop experience. So in other words, it's not in GA. Is no, that it's, not, it's not in the downloadable API connect from NPM. Okay. If you are testing, you don't get analytics with that testing. Okay. Do we have an expectation when we might see that? So, so uh, just a comment, and really it's a comment on the deployment. Um, I think with the first fix pack, uh, the deployment for the micro gateway will be available, and that's uh, when you should be able to use it. But it's again, it's only for the deployed micro gateway. Okay. Um, and so, in regard, so below, it seems like we have to enable it by. By setting an environment variable, so is it? So, and I heard it mentioned this is on the management node. So, so this is not something we actually set 
um, on the environment where the micro gateway is running. So in other words, uh, export API manager equals true or, or, or something. Or I guess I'm just trying to conf I'm, I'm confused about what that, that whole enable setting by that environment variable actually means. Yihong, where, where is that environment variable set? Is it set for the micro gateway or somewhere else? Um, if, if, uh, you mean the API manager environment variable? Yep. Okay. Uh, are you talking about its value or when it's set? So let's talk about both. Uh, first, where where is it set? Is it set for the runtime oh, of the micro gateway? The, it's a long time, so um, when you start a micro gateway, you will have uh, several uh, variables you have to uh, assign before you start a micro gateway in the management node. And this variable will be uh, set uh, when uh, you start to uh, run the micro gateway. And, and, and uh, this that's value that's will... Yihong, let me interrupt there for a second. So that, that API manager environment variable um, is set automatically in the professional deployment, I believe, and is used for other things like uh, extracting the uh, APIM artifacts from the server. Yes, correct. So you're just saying that that, yep. that also has to be set for your analytics to work properly. Um, yes. Uh, I, I should say uh, the, and, uh, the basic analytic middleware also uses this variable, just like uh, the, our data source uh, middleware. Uh, okay. I should say the data, so, uh, yeah. So yeah. to answer and your question, yes, yeah, so to answer your question, uh, yes, it has to be set for analytics, but it's already set uh, in the setup of the deployed micro gateway. So, so really, this is not yeah. an additional step. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah I, I would, I would have to assume once it's there. Uh, we'll see in the info center, so any requirements we'd need to enable it would be documented there. Yep. All right. And, and you have to consider that there's no API manager in a, like a developer experience, so there's really nobody to send analytics to, so it's really hard to support that. Any other questions? Whoops. Why don't you go ahead, uh, e Hong? Uh, yeah, I do have one I posted in the uh, in the chat. So, what is considered a basic DPI usage? Um, uh, the basic here is uh, just like uh, I mentioned. If you are familiar with the activity log of the edge gateway, uh, there are several uh, levels that you can have in the activity log of the edge gateway. Uh, one is the activity and the other is the header, and the other is the payload. So the basket here means we try to mimic the activity uh, level of the log. So, so we provide so a subset a of set. what you can get on data power. Yes, it's just like if you drag and drop a activity log in the edge gateway, and then you select the, uh, the log, uh, the content, Actually, the property name is content, and the value you assign is the activity, and you just have the same behavior. Uh, other questions? So, uh, when go ahead, Yi Hong. Okay, so thank you. If we go to the next page, I think uh, I list all the. Uh, Tables that I submit to, uh, I send to the elected search. So that's the basic uh, statistic that we send for the analytics. And most of the most of the value are received from the context variables, uh, except some of them like uh, return host, uh, that's the client ID or host name, and uh, by receive. That's the row bytes uh, we receive from client, and by send that's the row bytes we send to the client. And I think most of other uh, value actually is uh, are retrieved from the context variable. So 
uh, you can get more detailed information from the contest available. Okay, and so all of these properties are gathered for every transaction, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Any other questions on the information uh, uh, obtained for the analytics? All right, let's go ahead. Uh, okay, so, uh, yes, JavaScript policy. I think you already heard about the JavaScript policy several times uh, uh, in early session, in the debug sessions. So JavaScript policy actually uh, is uh, a handy policy that it can, could be used to execute a, a JavaScript snippet. Um, but, but uh, it has some constraints. So the constraints here is that uh, you are not able to use the required functions that we used uh, in most of the uh, node uh, programming language. So there is no require, so you are not able to require any third party uh, modules uh, in these uh, JavaScript policies. That's the first one constraint. And you can only access the uh, ECMA uh, 5.1 functions. And uh, you are not able to uh, allow to use any uh, sequence of functions uh, in your uh, code snippet. And uh, you are not able to use the uh, use trick declaration. So, therefore, you are not able to uh, use any box code declarations as well because you are not able to use the use trick. Uh, and but what uh, what things you can do inside the JavaScript policy is that you can direct access all of the contents variable inside your uh, JavaScript code, uh, just like uh, Libra's. Uh, Libra just put some example uh, uh, previous, so and Ali also have some examples uh, in in his sessions. So um, you can access all the context variable directly inside your JavaScript code. And uh, another thing is that you can use the console. We provide another console mo uh, modules. You can use the console module to log uh, the message, and those messages will go to the system log. Okay, I think we we'll go to the next page. Okay, so uh, so the big I think the big question will be uh, what's the difference between JavaScript policy uh, versus the user defined policy. So uh, just like I mentioned, because you are not able to use the require function uh, for any third party modules inside the JavaScript policies. So if you are doing anything uh, very typical uh, value checking or validations. You can use the JavaScript policy directly. Uh, if you remember the example of the if condition that Ellie has, to try to check some uh, quantity values, uh, and uh, she used the if condition to to show different exceptions. Actually, uh, you can do all of the if condition inside a single JavaScript policy directly. And you can inside this JavaScript policy, you can directly check load uh, context uh, uh, variable, check its quantity, uh, its value or not, and you can directly show the exception directly. So you don't have to compose three if, if sections. You, you could just put a, a JavaScript policy there uh, and contain those uh, uh, three different if checkings. And um, so if you are trying to uh, use some async functions, and you are also need to uh, uh, have some third-party module to uh, to complete some of the uh, the tasks that you need. Then you have to uh, create a user-defined policy uh, for that. And I think Thomas will cover that later. So uh, that's the difference between the JavaScript policy and the user-defined policy. So 
स्क्रीन शेयर कर सकते हैं स्टाइल ओके ये इज जस्ट अ सो सिंपल सिंपल जॉस के पास इज यू यू कैन सी द जॉस के कोड एक्चुअली इज डायरेक्टली इंबेड इनसाइड द द यामो फाइल द असेंबली सो इज जस्ट इंबेड इज अ स्ट्रिंग हियर सो ऑल ऑफ योर कोड वुड बी इंबेडेड इन इनसाइड द असेंबली so the first example is you can just directly um assign the request that order constant variable to a new context variable so it can have the uh, message that body the orders it should be array and you can have uh, those values uh, with the common and assign we assign to the request the order context variable that's the first uh, example and in the second example you just try to check uh, if the matches the body the order the quantity is a number or not if it's not you will show a uh, uh, java script error exception i think that's all for the test um i i i do have a, a question that i for, had forgotten uh, back when ali was presenting um if we throw an error object uh with the name and with a message yeah. uh can that message be accessed somewhere else does it can it be used to for oh, yeah. example can you just log um, it um yes uh 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 any uh, please give me on this um i think i believe that let's throw the uh, error object that is uh will be stored into the context uh the error as well so you can uh use context the error to access the error object and as well as the message i see cool yeah um any questions for uh ehong on the javascript policy Um let me just uh, scan through this real quickly. Okay. So next up uh we have uh Dan Bot again. Dan, are you still on? Thank you. Still here. All right, Dan, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um so logging for the micro gateway um basically by default there's a default configuration and then it's extensible to allow you to log differently into various places um is this the first slide sorry yes okay okay so yeah this is the introductory slide i'm i'm going to just talk about give an overview how to configure it where the output goes and um how it works with user defined policies and javascript policies so next okay so um logging in the micro gateway it's it's implemented through um the bunion package which is a nodejs thing um if you really want to understand how logging works in the micro gateway it would probably be a good thing to uh, look over and understand how bunion is configured unless you want to just do the default stuff because it has a lot of flexibility um in terms of what it logs and the formatting that it allows so um by default we provide logging levels fatal error warning info debug and trace um and those are controlled by as I'll show you in a bit um the names or the methods you use for the logger um it also allows for the creation of child loggers for so different components can be um have their logs logging um entries labeled so that they can be you know um uh, filtered out based on the component um so bunion um its output um to the log it, by default is json format and the bunion program itself can be used as a formatter um to format it into a, a human readable 
um, format. So if you're logging to a file by default, it goes, it's logged in, in JSON. And um, Bunyan also provides for customizable streams for output, you know, different files or, or you know, standard out, whatever. Um, and by default, logging is available to the apic.log file, and I'll tell you in a minute where that is, or there's a um, CLI command, apic logs, which um, print, prints the uh, output to the console. So next slide, please. Okay, so logging is controlled by a bunch of environment variables on the micro gateway. Um, the first one, APIC config path, is more of a general environment variable that specifies where the logging configura configuration file itself is. Um, then there's um, APIC log config file, um, and that specifies the location. By, besides the default log, you can also have a user-defined log. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. And then there's these two other ones, APIC log console level and file level, and that controls through an environment variable the, um, the lowest level that will be output uh, to a file or to the console. For example, so if you set it to like debug, that'll, that'll log debug and above, so info error, warning, all those other ones. If you want it a little bit more sparse, you would set it to error, and that would only um, log the error and above. So there's three sources of configuration, and there's a precedence to them. Um, you're allowed to define a, a user-defined um, log configuration file, and that can be either JSON or JavaScript. I'll show that in a second. Um, the JSON if, there, if you have both files, the JSON takes precedence over the, the JavaScript. Um, then there's a system log file, and that's um, configured through the APIC config path that I described above. And um, so th there's also the built-in um, configuration. And like I said, there's it's there's two two places it'll it'll um, log the console. Default is warning that can be overridden, and the stream is to the uh, file, the APIC dot log file, and that's um, unformatted. It, it has a um, ten file, one day rotation, and um, default level of info. Okay, and how big are these files? Currently, they can get arbitrarily large. Um, we're about to implement something that will set a maximum, but in in the you know the, the GA version we don't have that yet, so okay. we have to keep an eye on it. So next slide. Okay, so here's um, some example configuration files. On the left is the the JavaScript version. On the right is the JSON version. So the JavaScript version basically is just a small JavaScript program that exports this um, JSON. And what the JavaScript allows you to do is to do uh, do some things programmatically, whereas you know the job the JSON version is more of a hard coded. So you'll notice, for example, the path in the JavaScript version, you can specify a path based on your current home directory, whereas um, in the JSON version that has to be hard coded. So this is actually the default file um, configuration, I guess except for the level, the level's not debugged, but and and all these fields are are just um, bunion um, bunion type configuration. If if you look under the Bunyan package, you'll see what all these things mean and how to configure them. Um, so the next slide. 
And here's some examples of output. Um, the first one is the raw JSON that's sent to the APIC.log file. If you just count the file, you notice it's not very human readable, but if you're going to process it uh, programmatically, it's, it's very convenient to use that. And you'll notice the um, LOC field in there. Um, that is, I was talking about child loggers. That's the string that the, that's associated with a child logger. Um, the second one is the APIC.log formatted through the Bunyan program. And you can see that's a more typical human readable format. And then the third one is the CLI command APIC.logs. And that outputs a more um, compact version. And that goes to the console by default. It tails. If you do, I think it's dash n, it will not tail. And next slide. So logging in, in the user defined and JavaScript policies, um, kind of already went over this, but. Um, if you define your own policies, you can log to the system logger. Um, the Bunyan logger object is basically passed in to the, um, the flow engine object that's a parameter to the function. Um, and you can use all the standard methods. Um, there's an example one down there, logger.info. You could say logger.debug, logger.trace, logger.error, and it'll, it'll go to the various um, levels. Um, and yeah, so it it can it'll go to both the APIC.log file or the APIC.log CLI command or any other um, stream that you have configured through the configuration file. And I think that's all I had. All right. Any, any questions uh, for Dan on logging? Uh, we've got a couple more modules left. Uh, next up, uh, Thomas, are you still on? I'm still here. You want me to uh, flip the charts, or do you want to control? Uh, I'd like for you to flip them, please. Okay. Go ahead. <clears throat> okay, so user-defined policy, I almost feel like I don't need to talk about it anymore because uh, so many people before have, have uh, done a lot of coverage on this. But, um, you know, I'll just sort of take you through the details here. Um, User-defined policy um, is basically a, a node module, and it's, you know, you're only basically limited by your imagination uh, as to what you can do. Um, you can, you can uh, require uh, other node modules, um, you know, that are out there in the community. You can, um, you know, do, you know, sort of uh, whatever um, uh, JavaScript level or ECMAScript level that you're, um, you know, running <laughs> your gateway on um, to, to, you can use, you know, utilize it uh, to, you know, to whatever extent you see fit. Um, so we don't put any limitations on, you know, ECMAScript 5 specifically. Um, we don't even know what you have in your policy, uh, basically. But you're, you know, you're allowed to do JavaScript code, and, you know, we give you the hooks uh, into API management. You know, that you need to be able to, you know, pass properties and whatnot dynamically uh, to your um, to your policy, <clears throat> just like you would with a data power policy. So, you know, we haven't really invented anything uh, beyond what you can do with data power policies. Um, and so, for those of you that have done a user-defined policy, you know, on an edge gateway, you know, in previous releases, a lot of this will be familiar with you <coughs> for you. And so uh, the first thing I'd like to cover is, you know, what does a user-defined policy look like, you know, like when you're developing it? <coughs> and so, as I already mentioned, it's, a, uh, it's an NPM module, and so you, you know, it has a package.json, which is sort of the, you know, the center of the universe when it comes to uh, NPM modules. Uh, the package.json, you know, points to where your main uh, JS is. And in this case, I just happened to put my main JS under a lib directory and called it index.js. That's pretty conventional. Um, <clears throat> so this, um, 
and but but you know this is a the index js in this particular example would have contained the entire implementation because that's the only js file that there is there you're allowed to stick other uh stuff into the uh you know into this directory that your policy is implemented in like the readme.md um, you know, you can have a tra Travis.yaml and, and that sort of thing. You know, we're, we're just basically going to ignore it as far as the micro gateway is concerned. But, you know, there are some conventions that the community <coughs> has that, you know, that we're just going to let you do the same things. And the, uh, and so the, the, the piece that wouldn't be familiar to a node developer would be this policy.yaml file. And, uh, you know, we've got some flexibility as to what you can call this. Um, you know, it can be policy.yml, policy.yaml. And uh, there, there may be some um, decision to change this in the future, but right now uh, it's got to have one of those two names. And the convention is to do YAML uh, as sort of a best practice in this case. <coughs> Excuse me. This started right when it was my turn to talk. Um, so I think that's I'm done with this slide, Tim. If you would fast forward it to the next one. So I just talked about the policy.yaml. Let me give you a little more deep dive on this. The um, the policy.yaml is going to stick with the, the the schema that's already been defined uh, for uh, the 4.x version of uh, for API Manager, right? So I've got a link on this slide that takes you there. It shows you all the different types that are available, like uh, integer, number, string, boolean array. <coughs> and um, and so, you know, so this is, we're, we're basically, you know, we have the same support for that. Um, some key differences that you'll see with a policy YAML that, uh, that the 4. Uh, I think 3 is where it was introduced, the 4.3 product uh, would have is that in this case, it's actually called policy.yaml. It's not named after the file. Uh, it's not named after your policy name, which is the convention for 4.3 <coughs> and beyond, or 4.03. And also, you don't need to have the attach um, the field in your policy.yaml because it's not. It doesn't really apply for a micro gateway. Um, you know, the whole notion of attach uh, rest or um, Attach soap. Uh, it doesn't apply here. <laughs> and um, and also, you must include a gateways field to your policy.yaml. And I've given an example to this uh, gateways micro gateway. You could also have um, this is what you see here, where it says gateways, and there's a dash micro gateway. That's a uh, a, um, a representation of I think they call it a scalar, but it's a, basically an array. And so you could have micro gateway and data power gateway as, you know, so you can have one policy that supports both. Um, I don't really see people doing that too much um, initially, but it may be something that that picks up over time. So, but you can do that. And the, but it is required because the UI uh, uses that as a hint to um, place the this policy onto a, a palette for you to be able to drag over to your assembly. Uh, next slide, Tim. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to get to the meat of the of the policy, you know, the actual implementation. Uh, again, you know, I'll just remind you this is running under Node.js, um, and we've defined a, a pretty simple interface for the for the policy. You've got the module exports, which basically uh, tells the Flow Engine how to get to uh, the the meat and potatoes of your policy. You can pass in a config object. We haven't really gone through and, and and done a lot of documentation of how to use this config that's specified here. And this is a sort of a, a setup once config. Um, it is used by our rate limit policy to determine whether we're going to use Redis or a token bucket, a simple token bucket um, algorithm. At runtime, you can actually pass config into the policy as you're instantiating it. Um, but the the data power gateway uh, doesn't have support for this, so we're sort of keeping it close to the to, the, to our vest right now. And um, but we will you know, once we elaborate this into the uh, the policy YAML and uh, and you know to the definition, then we're probably going to you know show how do we set this um, you know on, on a broader scale <coughs> and have support in, in the UI for it. 
So that's what that config is. It can be empty. As a matter of fact, I think it'll typically be empty. It'll be an empty uh, JSON string, an empty JSON array. And uh, the the actual implementation, the runtime enforcement, is uh, is handled by this uh, return function. And you've got props context flow. You saw this earlier today, where you have the props. The props is a uh, is a JSON object that contains the um, the configuration that was set for this policy in the assembly. So you know when you drag a, a policy over to the assembly, you get the opportunity to fill in some values that you've defined in your policy YAML, and uh, those values get basically you know bundled into the the assembly flow in the Swagger document. The, our extension to the Swagger document that gets passed down to the uh, to the runtime. And then once you uh, actually get to enforcing your policy, your properties that were defined um, and set in the assembly UI get passed in that properties uh, variable right there. You also have access to the context, and the context is sort of the center of um, you know the, the stuff that you want to work with. Uh, that's how you get to your headers. That's how you get to your message body. Uh, that's how you get to, uh, gosh, what's the third thing? and variables, context variables. All that is sitting in context. <clears throat> and then flow is a uh, is an object that contains some um, some some helper methods uh, that you need to be able to properly um, go through the uh, you know like proceed to the next policy or do so it'll, it'll contain a logger and it'll um, and it'll you know there's some other stuff that I'll cover a little bit later. Okay, so uh, Tim, next slide. <coughs> okay, so um, I, I just went through what these are. I guess I don't need to read it off to you again. But again, this is uh, the config, uh, which is, you know, we mentioned, we talk about, but we don't go do too much about um, you know, documenting it right now because we're still refining how we want to present that to customers and the props context flow or the other parameters. Um, so Tim, I should have asked you to advance before we got to this one, but thank you. Sure. Okay, so the flow parameter, as I'd mentioned earlier, you know, definitely is worthy of a little more deeper dive uh, on what you uh, what you can do with it. Um, you saw the flow dot proceed um, in the um, in the example that we had shown. That's basically uh, returning control back to the flow engine, so it, could, it can take you to the next policy in the chain. Or return back to the uh, to the client. Um, you can also say that uh, you know, hey, whatever I've been doing in code, you know, I fail, and so you can fail and give it a reason, and uh, and then the, the 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 flow engine will try to handle it, and if it can't handle the error, then it'll uh, it'll return back to the client. Uh, you can also call stop, which basically says, hey, I'm the last guy in the chain. I don't care if other policies are defined. You know, in the in the assembly, um, you know, you shouldn't go any farther. Um, there's a bunion logger. You heard Dan talk about that, and he, uh, you know, gave a lot of detail on how to set, you know, where where does stuff get logged, and whatnot. What error level does it get logged? And uh, Tim, next slide, please. Uh, can I ask you a question there? Uh, sure. Um, so the error that you passed, the error object that you passed to the fail method. Um, is that the standard uh, exception? Does it have a, a name and a message? And will it show up as a thrown error? That's a good question, and I can't uh, answer that, but I know we've got people on the call that can. So, Let me Libra? see if Yi Hong is still on. Yi Hong, are you still there? Or Ali? Yi Hong, are you there? Uh, Libra, hey, any Tim, thoughts? Well, what's Sorry. the question? Okay, so the question is uh, the fail method uh, on the uh, flow object. Uh, if you pass it an error object, uh, is that the same as throwing an error? Will it be caught yes, by perhaps. somebody looking for that name? Yes, it's um, like throwing an yeah. error. So Go ahead, Allie. And uh, so the error option must have name and message, optional message. Okay. 
and, and it, it will be handled just as though it was thrown. Correct? Okay, so I'm, I'm, let me just make the statement, and Ali, keep me honest. Uh, so this is a thrown error, and it can be caught just like any other error in the system. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay, so Tim, that's a great question, and I'm going to write it down, and we probably need to document the, the, the format of that error object that gets placed into there. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, no, no problem. This is a good question. Okay. Um, so uh, it's some additional stuff that you can uh, get from the, uh, the, the flow object is uh, the ability to, to subscribe to events, and these are um, uh, policy enforcement related events. And so you can do things like I want to subscribe to when a particular policy you know, has finished uh, or, or basically, actually, when the transaction is finished, or you know, if the before or after some other policy has been enforced, and so there are certain um, things that are done in the edge gateway that sort of required a lot of hands-on um, um, manipulation uh, by by the actual enforcement framework uh, for things like the. Um, uh, for, for things like the uh, analytics and redaction and stuff like that, and so this uh, this support uh, to be able to subscribe to uh, to like when a transaction is finished and and that sort of thing, it gives us the ability to do the same sort of thing without actually having to bake uh, the the the, um, the help into the uh, the enforcement and sort of, you know it's sort of um, the antithesis of subscribing to something would be to unsubscribe something. So you can you can subscribe and unsubscribe uh, events uh, related to policies and to the uh, to, to the enforcement of a flow. Okay, Tim, I'm done with that slide. Next one, please. Hey, uh, question Thomas, there. I think there is a question on um, the discussion whether the Java whether the user-defined policy is available on, gateway, available on, on, on data power or not? User-defined policies are available on the data power gateway, but not um, the, not ones that run Node. Um, so the data power gateway has uh, supported uh, user policies since I think 4.0.3.0, and um, but it's it's strictly a data power implementation. So you actually have to create a processing rule and pull your data power processing actions onto that rule, and you have a certain API that you need to call to get your properties and, and to get your, uh, um, you know, the payload and that sort of thing. And and, and it does uh, depart from the way this, or actually I should say this departs from the way that you would do it on the data power uh, implementation because we wanted this to be a lot more accessible to the Node community so that when you have a Node developer sit down and create a user-defined policy for the micro gateway, they're in familiar territory. They know exactly what to do, and they just add another file and do a couple of other things, and and you know it's 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 you know a happy place for them. And so I think I go into a um, some packaging or deploying. Okay, so I've got some deploy slides as to what these look like, and what I can do is I can. Uh, you know, talk to the differences between the data power experience and the uh, the, the micro gateway experience as I'm going through these next few slides. <coughs> and as I'd mentioned earlier, you can actually create a single uh, policy with data power implementation and a micro gateway implementation. Um, but there are some limitations in this release as to you know how we can handle that sort of thing, and I'll try to highlight those as I proceed. Okay, so um, in the offline experience, also known as the developer experience or the laptop experience, um, you can actually, once you've created your policy, you can actually go off and, 
and uh, test your policy in the offline experience. And to do that, you you know pick a place to put your policy. Like in this case, I put it in my home directory. I created a a, uh, a directory called My Policies, and I stuck my cool policy under there. Now that's a, a directory, and it would contain the package JSON, the policy YAML, and the implementation, and whatever I, you know node type of stuff I wanted to put in there. And then um, one thing that's actually missing. Uh, from here is that there's a step that you would run right after that. Once you put it in that directory, you would actually run npm install to resolve whatever dependencies that you've got, you know, in the, in your particular package. Because the the micro gateway doesn't handle the the dependency resolution. It can't go out to the internet to say, oh, I'm using Lodash or or that sort of thing. So you know, you need to make sure you resolve those dependencies, and then you can go in and update the. Uh, Either your .API Connect file in your home directory, or excuse me, yeah, the .API Connect file in your home directory, or in your. Uh, that's actually wrong. There's a .API Connect directory with a config file in it. Tim, I need to edit this um, at some point. Or there's a project uh, that you're running. If you're doing the uh, your typical laptop experience, you you would have created a project. And then there's a .API Connect file in there, and you add uh, the directory that would contain your uh, your API Connect policies. And in this case, I've got another inconsistency. I've, pre I've pointed to an API Connect policy instead of my policies. So I apologize for the inconsistencies on this slide. But you you point to it with a with a YAML uh, addition to these uh, the, either the config file or the .API Connect file. And uh, and then when you when you bring up the the APIC editor, it'll go off and find your policies based on you know the contents of this directory. And then when you run traffic through the micro gateway, it's able to find the policies as well. So you know the, the it's important for this to show up in your assembly editor on your UI experience, but it's also important for the uh, micro gateway to go off and find these. And so sans all the typos on this particular slide, you know, this is how you set it up. Um, Tim, next slide, please. And uh, offline experience, looks like this might be the same information again. Oh, my larger. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so this would have, uh, you know, had would have been good to review after a four nights rest. Uh, um, next chart. Yeah, next chart. Uh, that's the last one. Okay, so I know what happened here. I, I think that I might have um, uh, pushed the wrong file up. Uh, so Tim, flip back to the offline experience uh, again. Um, this was supposed to be the online experience. <laughs> And so uh, I'll talk a minute here about packaging uh, for the for the offline experience, uh, the online experience. Um, so uh, the the data power when you create a policy uh, for data power, there's a zip file that contains the policy uh, definition. So it's you know it's essentially your policy YAML, and then there's a directory called implementation that would contain your data power implementation. It's basically an export or a zip uh, containing the, your exported configuration for data power. And it's in a zip as a, as a convenience because that's how data power moves, you know, how you can move configuration from one data power appliance to the next pretty easily. And that zip contains your processing rules or your configuration uh, describing your processing rules, your, you know, whatever, you know, XSLT or, or gateway script files that you have and uh, the processing actions and that sort of thing. And so there's, you know, there's already an established convention for that. And so in that same implementation directory, you can take the contents of your, uh, your, your node.js implementation and zip it up and put it in the directory, the same implementation directory as the, um, as a uh, policy name dot mgw file, and I think uh, Stephen Cox is actually talking a little bit about this on the uh, the meeting stream on the side here. And so you place that there, but you also have to realize that you need to update your policy YAML. Let's say if you're adding uh, a 
micro gateway policy uh, to uh, a data power policy, you have to update your your gateways. Um, um, you, to, you have to add the gateways uh, property to the policy YAML to tell uh, the the UI that this is effective for the micro gateway. And in fact, there's a there's a bug open on on the uh, the implementation right now that you have to specify data power gateway uh, to get it to, to work to import properly. You have to have the gateways keyword for now, but I think that bug will be fixed soon. Um, and the uh, but the, the 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 story doesn't stop there. So that just gets it to where the policy shows up on the UI in the API manager. But there's no uh, the, the there's we haven't architected the flow all the way out to like deploying a policy yet, like it would on Data Power. So as soon as you import a a policy, a data power based policy into the uh, API manager, it takes that policy and manipulates it and pushes it out to the data power appliance. But there's no flow like that to, to send the policy out to the, um, to the micro gateway yet. And so there's another manual step that when you're running in a uh, in the in the micro gateway in the online experience, you'll have to place the the policies into a, a location, point to them just like I'd mentioned for the uh, for the, for the uh, offline experience, and then you'll have to do the npm install to resolve the dependencies, and then you bundle up the gateway as part of the instructions for for deploying the gateway, and uh, and basically deploying them through either a Liberty Collective or through the um, like a standalone. Actually, you won't need to deploy it in a standalone gateway mode, like for the uh, essentials. Okay, sorry that that this last slide was a goof, and I uh, and I had to pretty much talk through the whole thing. Um, but we'll get updated slides out. Yeah, actually, I was going to say, you know, Tim, if you could, uh, you mentioned a couple of adjustments to this deck. If you can uh, go ahead and do that and get that over to me. Uh, when you can, then I'll, I'll get this published out along with the video for this session uh, onto the media library where I, the other ones are posted. We will do so. And I was also thinking perhaps in the second session, maybe we just briefly cover some of the user-defined stuff if there are differences. OK. Um, anything else, uh, Thomas? No, I'm, I'm pretty much out of breath. So uh, yeah, if we can go to the next presentation. And anybody else have questions for, for Thomas on the user-defined policies? So, so Tim, is there more? I think we're at time. I thought we had a 7 to, to 9.30 slot. Um, is there more, more to cover? There is. There's one additional section. Um, John Falgon, are you on? Yes. Um, Mike, do you want to continue, or? Uh, how, how much longer do you have? Do you uh, maybe. Maybe 10 minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Just get done. All right. Um, so the data store is the component. If you recall the uh, um, diagram or picture that uh, Lieber mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it was the component all the way to the right. Um, it's responsible. It's kind of like the, the the micro gateways database containing all the relevant information about what what the micro gateway should actually enforce. Um, so the data store itself is actually a loopback application um, that contains all this information. Um, the the micro gateway is responsible for starting the data store. So as as Tim mentioned early on, they kind of go hand in hand. Micro gateway currently. Uh, um, for each micro gateway instance, you have a data store instance. Um, so uh, they're meant to run on the same system. Um, maybe, maybe understanding what the data store is will go to answer Dinesh's question from early on about whether this is, um, you know, realistic to deploy in the DMZ. Um, the, the, the only user of the data store in reality should be the micro gateway. Um, and if you need to extend the micro gateway, the facilities for accessing information in the uh, data store are, are in that um, directory data store client index.js. There's a few 
uh, a few methods that somebody can utilize to, to call the data store, to query information in the data store. Um, so the data store being an application, uh, it, it actually listens on a uh, the loopback uh, uh, IP address um, on a specified port um, for HTTP requests. Um, so uh, by default, if you don't specify the data store underscore port environment variable, um, then it'll just listen on an ephemeral port, which should be fine for pretty much every um, every deployment. It's just uh, it, 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 and for debugability, it's nice to be able to specify a, a specific port to listen on. Um, and here's the warnings, uh, and this I, I mentioned this may be a reason uh, to, to not deploy in the DMZ. So. Um, it's not currently, the, this loopback application is not currently uh, protected by an access control list, so there's no um, type of uh, user um, that, that needs to access this information. It, it's basically whoever is able to access this port and send, uh, send HB requests to it can access it. Uh, it's not HTTPS protected, so um, it, it, it's just HTTP. Um, so the, the information that's going back and forth, although it's happening over the loopback interface, um, is, is uh, in the clear. Um, there's actually more uh, methods. Uh, since we exposed it using or developed this application using loopback, we kind of left a lot of the defaults, including a lot of the um, default methods that, that REST methods that are exposed um, when uh, creating a, a loopback application. Um, so right now there's actually more uh, methods than should really be exposed. Um, in, in reality, all that should be exposed are get type methods, um, and, and updating shouldn't happen. Uh, updating of information shouldn't be allowed um, up by the data store. Um, and uh, another warning, uh, the loopback explorer is enabled by default. So um, if, in case you knew what ephemeral port the data store was listening on, you could actually hit that um, with your browser and view the information in, the, um, in this loopback application. So if you click next, please, Tim, um, you'll see what the, the models are, um, the, the, the models for the data store. Uh, API store, the open API or Swagger documents. Um, catalog, product, registry, subscription, and TLS profile, those are all um, artifacts of, of uh, API management. Um, uh, there's, there's a few that are interesting. Webhook is unused. Uh, um, snapshot is, is what we use. It's a mechanism we use to keep track of the latest configuration. Uh, and optimized data is what happens is we actually, um, at, uh, when we gather up information, um, either from the file system or from API management, we create a separate model that's optimized for runtime lookup. Because if we had to query each one of these models for the relevant information at runtime, it would get uh, pretty slow. Um, so we create a, uh, once information gets updated, either in API or product or subscription, we we actually go ahead and, and process that information and populate the optimized data uh, model, um, and that's the one that the micro gateway uses majority of the time at, at runtime. Um, and click on the next uh, slide. So just two more um, slides here. Uh, the development environment or offline experience, what happens? Uh, so when, when the micro gateway starts the data store, the data store will um, look in the, uh, the relevant directory, load all the um, YAML documents, assume that they're APIs, that they're, that they're really um, Swagger uh, documents, um, and uh, that'll populate the API model. Um, and then from there, it'll in order for the micro gateway to work, it needs a, a product catalog. It needs some information in the product catalog and subscription models. So it just populates them with some default um, information just to make sure that things work. Um, and 
uh, just so that you can utilize uh, uh, rate limiting, there's a laptop underscore rate limit um, uh, environment variable that defaults to 100 per, per hour um, that's available um, for, for testing rate limiting. Uh, and then the last slide uh, is on the on-premise environment behavior. And the way we developed the data store, it really had to meet a few requirements that were essential to API management. One, uh, it made sure that in the event it's unable to contact API management uh, uh, server for the latest and greatest information, uh, you still want your gateway instance to be up and running. So um, it ensures that it always has validated use by persisting uh, the information to disk when, um, when it uh, downloads information from API management management server, it persists that information such that in the event it's unable to reach API management server, it still has that persisted information that it can use. Um, it periodically pulls API manager for a uh, management server for uh, information uh, for updates. Uh, it does it on a 15 minute interval. Um, you can change that, although it's not recommended because uh, if you pull it any faster, sure, you may get updates more frequently, but you'll also put additional load on the API manager uh, server. Um, and then uh, that other model that I mentioned, the snapshot model, um, that was created to address a, another um, requirement of API management, uh, you know, API Connect, uh, in that the ability for somebody to create or modify, um, you know, APIs and publish them without impacting any of the other in-flight transactions or, you know, currently available um, uh, APIs. So uh, the snapshot mechanism makes sure that these in-flight transactions aren't impacted by, by any updates to existing configuration. Um, and it, it really makes sure that there's, there's no delays or latency that occurs while um, processing new configurations. So um, new configuration uh, it won't be made available until um, it, it, it's, it's uh, completely been processed and the optimized data model has been completely populated. Um, so if, if the data store discovers that there's new, um, there's new and updated information that it needs to process, it'll go and do that off to the side. In the meantime, um, existing transactions will continue to use the, the previous configuration until such a time that the new configuration is available, ready, um, and, and uh, ready to be processed. Um, there is a bit of protection between, uh, um, uh, uh, of the information that's that's stored and, and kept on, um, as well as the communication between the micro gateway and uh, a, and the API management server, um, and and that's protected by a um, key uh, key pair, um, and uh, you can specify that information using the key name uh, environment variable. And that was my ten minutes. Yeah, so John, I, I would like to make uh, one sort of distinction. Uh, you've been talking about the on-prem uh, scenario and how this works, um, but when you uh, do it offline, uh, the data store is still in effect, but it's only picked up at one point, right, when you start it up. Right, so the refresh interval really only applies to the on-premise environment. The the offline or development experience, it's picked up once when you start the gateway. Um, if, you, if you update the, um, you know, add a new uh, open API YAML document or um, modify an existing one, if you want the gateway to see it, you need to restart the, um, restart the gateway. Any questions for John? Other questions? I do have just a couple of comments uh, to close with. Any questions? Um, if, if not, uh, let, let me just mention a couple of things. One is that the uh, user-defined policies are listed as beta for this first release. Um, and, and I think uh, Thomas mentioned uh, that there are plans uh, to update
update the interface as we go, so that's why it's listed as beta. Um, a second thing I wanted to mention is the uh, difference between uh, JavaScript and Gateway Script. Uh, if you're doing a custom policy, um, uh, the JavaScript uh, really only allows you or allows you to access uh, any modules, whereas Gateway Script uh, only allows you to access the modules that Data Power has created and are uh, available. Um, there are some extensions you can do. You can create uh, some some modules of your own, uh, but you don't have access as as much access as you do um, with pure JavaScript uh, in the user policy, user defined policy on the micro gateway. So so there are some differences. There certainly is some level of overlap uh, if you just stick with the JavaScript language and you stick with context variables. Um, then, then there are cases where you could have the same policy defined for both. Um, let, let me also mention uh, there is no redact. We, we talked about some of the uh, policy constructs, uh, and I think it was mentioned the, the redact policy and perhaps the, um, the uh, activity log policy. Uh, those are not uh, policies that we currently have in the micro gateway in this first release. And uh, last, I, I wanted to mention just uh, a, a big thanks uh, for the team for pulling together these charts. Uh, Libra, Dan, John Balesa, Ellie, uh, Gary, Yihong, and uh, John Palgon. Uh, thanks very much for, for pulling together the materials. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Michael. Great. Thanks, Tim. I really appreciate it. Uh, good stuff uh, here today. So just a quick note for folks on the phone. So we do have... Uh, uh, another T3 session here in about a, about an hour, 15 minute time. A, a short follow up to the analytics session that was started last week. Um, but uh, you know, with that, if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and, and close this one out. Okay. Thanks, everybody.